In the third and fourth centuries, there was a movement of men and women of faith who began to leave their life in uh, the big cities and head to the remote deserts of places like Egypt, seeking a life of quiet and prayer and service, living as monks and nuns. These people became known as desert fathers and mothers, and we have collections of their wise sayings and little anecdotes about their lives in uh, a work that's known as the Sayings of the Fathers. The most quoted of all those desert fathers and mothers is Abba Pimin, who was known as a compassionate spiritual guide to others who were seeking God. And the story is told that some other monks came to see Abba Pimin and said to him, Tell us when we see brothers falling asleep and dozing off during the sacred office, so like during their holy duty to prayer, should we pinch them so they will stay awake? And Abba Pimin said to them, For my part, when I have seen a brother who is dozing off, I put his head on my knees and I let him rest. We explore rhythms of kindness this week. Kindness, in the view of the scriptures, is both a disposition and a way of acting. First and foremost, it is God's disposition and way of acting towards us. Uh, in the Old Testament, there is a Hebrew word, chesed, you got to get that guttural ch in there, uh, which can be translated as kindness. But I really like the rendering in some older translations, things like the King James Bible, that translate chesed as loving kindness, this big compound word. It's such an incredibly robust term that's utilized over and over again to point to the way that God is and the way that God does. The Psalms say of God, your loving kindness is before my eyes. And because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. In Psalm 103, the psalmist sings, Bless the Lord, O my soul, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. In the Gospels, Jesus points out the kindness of God who shows all this goodness and provision to even ungrateful and nasty people. And he invites his followers, us, to imitate God's kindness by loving even our enemies. Kindness is a tender heart toward others that's made into an action. Kindness is, as Mark Twain once wrote, the language which the deaf can hear and the blind can see. Throughout the New Testament, the Greek word that gets translated as kindness connotes a compassionate act that is actually useful and helpful to another person. So like meeting real needs with a warmth. So the Apostle Paul instructs the church of Ephesus to get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, slander, and other types of evil behavior. Instead, he says, be kind to each other tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. One of my personal favorite stories about kindness in the Bible is about a man named Mephibosheth. You can try and say that three times. Mephibosheth was the son of Jonathan and the grandson of Israel's first king, Saul, uh, both Grandpa Saul and Daddy Jonathan died in a battle, leaving a very young Mephibosheth as the only natural heir to the king's throne. However, God had different plans and made this good-looking, multi-talented young man named David the new king of Israel. David was anointed by the people. He was given the throne and Mephibosheth went into hiding precisely because he was worried that he would be seen as David's enemy. It was customary in those days for the king of a new dynasty to, like, kill completely, wipe out anyone who was connected to the previous dynasty, and especially relatives of the king. They were a political threat. A shifting of powers had taken place, and Mephibosheth's life as a descendant of Saul 
might well be on the line as he could pose a threat to David's kingship. So fast forward some years, and 2 Samuel 9 begins with David asking a surprising question. Is anyone in Saul's family still alive to whom I can show kindness? Well, there's a former henchman of Saul who says, yeah, there is one family member who's still around, but he is hiding. David insists that he wants to show this person God's kindness. When Mephibosheth is eventually hauled before King David, I imagine that he must be shaking in his boots, thinking this is it. He's going to meet an untimely demise at the hand uh, or the hands of his grandpa's former enemy. Mephibosheth throws himself on the ground in front of David. But David says again for the third time, I want to show you kindness. And David then promises to restore Mephibosheth land that had belonged to his grandfather Saul. And he declared that from now on, Mephibosheth would be eating at the king's table. Mephibosheth is, as you might imagine, totally flabbergasted by the kindness of David. And he says, who is your servant that you should show such kindness to a dead dog like me? That is a great line. Uh, The narrator tells us that the would-be enemy of David is instead treated like one of his own sons because that is what kindness means. Constant kindness can accomplish much as the sun makes ice melt. Kindness causes misunderstanding, mistrust, and hostility to evaporate. I didn't make that up. Albert Schweitzer said that. Where do you desire to experience kindness in your life. Take a few minutes and think about it. Where do you feel a sense of longing to know more deeply that God is truly a God of kindness? What would it mean to you to begin to comprehend that you have been invited to sit at the king's table? Where do you long to see kindness played out in the world around you? How do you desire to see kindness grow in you, to have tenderness and warmth grow in you that can become a healing, helpful action for those around you? Consider those questions now. Pause the video for a minute. Uh, Make any notes in your workbook that seem important regarding your own desire for kindness to grow in your life. Now, unfortunately, I think we can easily talk ourselves into looking down on kindness sometimes. It it can be seen as like a lower class virtue or like optional chips and dip compared to just doing what needs to be done or just saying what needs to be said. Frankly, that way of thinking usually just means that we're seeking justification for acting like a total jerk. But we do find ways to talk ourselves into thinking that an action can be completely void of kindness and yet still be truly good. We're mistaken. Maybe kindness sounds too simplistic or childish. It doesn't hold importance in a fast-paced, competitive, highly efficient, starkly realistic world of grown-ups. Perhaps we have some resistant, uh, some resistance to kindness, to, to God's kindness to us, to the kindness of others or to showing kindness to those around us. So consider these questions. Where or in what ways are you resistant to kindness in your life? In what ways have you become convinced that God is anything but a God of kindness? How have you resisted or refused the kindness of others? When do you opt for bitterness, rage, harsh words, slander, rather than practicing real kindness? Take a couple more minutes to prayerfully think through some of those questions regarding both desire and resistance to kindness and make any notes in your workbook that might be helpful as you continue to pray and reflect and as you work toward your rule of life tomorrow. And may you know God's loving kindness to be better than life.